Many of you know as the uh, Star Trek and Voyages panel, okay. and we are here to uh, dazzle you and answer all your questions. Oh, I'm Mark Scott Zickrey, um, author of the Twilight Zone Companion, and a writer for Sliders, Star Trek Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Babylon 5, etc. Um, uh, Dorothy, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Oh, I'm DC Fontana, and I was on the original Star Trek. Okay. Uh, most recently, thank you. Uh, I've done a lot of television work, I've written some novels. Uh, most recently, I wrote, with a partner, Derek Chester, I wrote two Star Trek games. One is called Star Trek Tactical Assault, the other one is called Star Trek Legacy. Legacy has all five captains uh, for voiceovers. So, um, they will be out, I believe, this fall, but I don't know exactly when yet. And I wrote the New Voyages script that is going to be available for download in September. So, uh, starring Walter Keane. So I pass this on now to Michael Reeves, my dear friend. One other thing this woman has done, or I say not has done, but she has a rock group named after her. Yeah. How, how cool is that? <laughs> I thought it was so cool. And and I sued them. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, my name is Michael Reeves. I'm also a writer. I've written entirely too much television. I've uh, done a lot of animation, like Gargoyles, Batman, also. Thank you. Also in for Next Generation, Sliders, um, Monsters, The Flash, and I've also written books. I'm currently writing a bunch of Star Wars novels, yeah. comic books. Now, I may be the only person around to be writing for Star Wars and Star Trek simultaneously. Well, my, well I should mention, Michael is probably the only person who's actually worked for, directly for Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, and Gene Roddenberry. And, and lived. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Although the jury's still out on my last. Anyway, so, um, yeah, and uh, I guess that's about it, and we'll get started with the show. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Great. Thanks. And, um, and also something I, I brought today for, uh, for Dorothy this time, because I think a big part of the reason that Michael and I are writers is largely thanks to your work, Dorothy. And I actually, when I was, um, when Star Trek was on, I actually met Michelle Nichols, and she gave me an original of one of her copies of uh, Friday's Child that you wrote, so I'm going to have you do the honors okay. in a little while. So, um, so I guess why don't we start um, um, by, by talking about how you got involved in, in uh, New Voyages and how that came about, and then we, Michael and I can talk about sort of what we're up to. Okay. Uh, I got involved uh, when Walter Koenig approached me and said, uh, there's this online Star Trek that you should know about, and I would like to do one, and I'd like you to write it. Would you be interested? So I was intrigued, and I went over and talked to uh, Doug Drexler, who was also involved uh, in the terms of the CGI uh, <coughs> uh, effects that are on the show. And uh, they showed me um, episode two, which is the one that's very complex, and you really have to be a Star Trek and very knowledgeable Star Trek fan yeah. to follow that one. Even I was like, wait a minute, oh yes, right, I got it, I got it. <laughs> But Walter wanted something that was a personal story, and uh, uh, I came up with one, and he liked it, and uh, I wrote the script. It was great to be able to go back and visit that universe one more time with those wonderful characters that I loved so much. Um, the If you don't know this, it's a double conceit. It not only picks up after the third season of the original series, but it's actors playing the actors playing the roles. So <laughs> it's a lot of fun and it's very well done. The sets are magnificent. They're all built by, mostly by James Cawley. Yes. Uh, and, and they look exactly like the original Star Trek sets. The costumes, he consulted, Jim consulted with uh, Bill Tice before he passed away. And he even got some of the original Star Trek, uh, you know, the velour material for the shirts. Bill just gave it to him. Uh, and said, here, use it. Nobody else is going to use it. You use it on your show. So the, the outfits look very much like the originals. And, uh, you know, the stories have been pretty good. So uh, <coughs> I enjoyed the experience very much. I did not get a chance to go back and watch them film it. But uh, I am told it turned out very well. Walter is extremely pleased. And I'm looking forward to downloading it myself. Great. Um, well, the thing that I find so fascinating about Star Trek and Voyages is that uh, for those of us who work in television, I mean, between Michael and myself, we sold more than 400 teleplays to the various networks and, uh, and on a number of shows. But now, of course, the future is the internet and television merging into one. And with YouTube and a lot of the things now where the networks are getting, are signing people for talent deals coming off of YouTube and so forth, it was fascinating to me 
what was happening with the voyages and the way uh, Michael and I came aboard New Voyages. And also, by the way, um, uh, James Cawley, who plays Kirk and who built the sets and is one of the executive producers on this, uh, he worked under Bill Tice on Next Gen as an assistant costumer, and because Tice was a department head on the original Star Trek, he had the blueprints of all the sets. And that's where James got the blueprints and then built the sets in Ticonderoga, New York, where he lives. And the way I first heard New Voyages was um, about a year ago. I was on a panel at a science fiction convention at UCLA. It was the future of Star Trek, and it was uh, Walter Koenig and both Ron Moores, Ron D and Ron B, and, uh, and a number of other people who had been involved in various uh, incarnations of Trek. And someone said from the audience, what's the future of Star Trek? And Walter said, well, New Voyages, because Dorothy Fontana's just written one line in the star, and, and we're about to shoot it. And so I, I spent about an hour talking to Walter afterwards, and just everything I could find out about this. I was so fascinated. And then I went home and watched the second. The first episode they did is called Come What May. It's a little bit shaky. They were just learning what they were doing. Second episode, though, called In Harm's Way, is a sequel to The Doomsday Machine, and William Wyndham reprises his role as Deckard, and uh, Barbara Luna's in it, and Malachi Throne, now all actors who were in the original show as guest, guest, guest stars. And I was astonished by both the fact that it was, because at this point, Enterprise was doing everything, in my opinion, doing everything wrong in terms of, they, they, I mean, they, they just seemed so tired, and it, it just so limited. And, Inter and, and New Voyages, which actually beat uh, Enterprise in a single night by two million viewers, um, was doing everything right. It was coming from joy and enthusiasm and knowledge and respect for the original. And I was just um, amazed by this. And that's when, of course, um, I think, Michael, you might want to tell your, okay. your part of this. <coughs> Technical problems. OK, well, let's go back 30 years to when Paramount was going to do the remake of Star Trek the series as Star Trek Phase Two. And unfortunately, it's going to let you know how old I am, but I had just come into town and I got a couple of sales out of my belt and I managed to wrangle a meeting at Star Trek Phase Two. So I went and I pitched them a story, which they really liked. They were going to buy it. And then uh, Paramount Star Wars came out and Paramount said, well, saw this, we're going to make a movie. And so they shut down the production on Phase Two to make uh, Star Trek motion picture. So I was, of course, you know, heartbroken. It was a little bit of, maybe feel a little bit better than everybody else got down too, but you know. So anyway, the shelf goes back, and the script goes back on the shelf. 30 years later, it says now script, it's just a pitch. 30 years later, New Voyages comes along, and um, Mark says to me, why don't we try uh, pitching that idea? Um, I don't know, should we give me the, uh, the punchline? Oh, the, the, the basic notion. The basic notion, yeah. The fun part about it is, it's an idea that uh, was 30 years in the, between pitch and, and getting it made. And the central conceit in the idea is that Sulu, through a transporter malfunction, ages 30 years. Yeah. So it's kind of serendipity. But I think I hold the world's record now for the longest time between a, a pitch and a green light on the same show. <laughs> But, but, but rather than it being like the, dead, the, the deadly years, it was, it was actually that he has a life elsewhere and is, is, is th literally has lived for 30 years and has had a life. And so it, it's different from the inner light. We take it in a different direction. But it was amazing. Also before that. Yeah, yes. But, 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 now, but now George is actually 30 years older, so it saved us on the makeup. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but, but, but also, I had wanted to work with George Decay for many years. I had interviewed him uh, when I wrote The Twilight Zone Companion because George was actually in one of the lost episodes of The Twilight Zone. The one that one, one wasn't in syndication. It's a terrific two-character episode called The Encounter that stars George and Neville Brand. Now, now thankfully, it's on DVD. And um, so on all these shows I've been on, Sliders and so forth, I've wanted, I've been always looking for a role for George so I could work with him because he's a terrific actor. And so, so I remember this wonderful story idea that Michael had come up with. And we had, um, when I started in television, Michael and I collaborated, and I'd always looked for an opportunity to do, to do more work with Michael as well. So I typed up a, a premise, ran it by Michael, remembering his storyline, so we'd hashed out the storyline. And then I went over to George Decay's house, and I said, uh, well, basically, initially, I emailed New Voyages, and I said, well, would you guys be interested in this? Michael's an Emmy winner, and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and I got an email back that basically, if you read between the lines, it basically said, you know, dear loser fanboy, fuck off. And uh, <laughs> so, so I said, either this is some kind of automatic generator that just keys off certain words, like, would you be interested in the submission, or these guys are really arrogant. And uh, so I, I got the phone number of one of the producers and called him, and it was just an automatic 
thing, and, and they, they very much were, wanted to do it. And so then I went to George's house and gave him the premise, and he, was, he really wanted to do it too. And the idea of an episode of, with, with, DC, with, with DC Fontana and, and Walter, and then one with, with George, is just such a cool, cool idea. So, but if you want to talk more about you know, how your story and or, the, or anything well, else. I, I don't want to give away the punchline, although probably everybody's heard it. Chrome okay. uh, showed part of it. Oh, okay. The clip, small clip. All right. Um, I, I did want to point out one thing, is that this is a totally free download, right? It's, it's yes. completely free. Uh, what you do need is a fast download device, your DSL, cable, whatever, right? Um, they might even yeah. send you a CD if you really banged. <laughs> well, well, also, they, they have the capacity where you can download it as a DVD. The, the main thing yes. is that Paramount, Paramount is not allowing them to sell it officially. Right. At they this cannot point, charge right? It's not licensed officially now, but it might become licensed, yeah. we hope, you know, so. Well, I, they got, um, on the episode two, over 22 million downloads. That's not hits. That's downloads. People wanted what they were offering. That was more than Enterprise got, literally. That, that was a more audience than, than Enterprise got. Um, they're, they're really great people. Uh, what got me was the fan network. And this is a, a little sidebar at the moment. Everybody seems to know what the story is. Uh, but I was interviewed about New Voyages, and um, the interviewer at the end of it, this is in England, said to me, um, and how did you like being uh, asked to write Battlestar Galactica? And I said, I, I've not been asked to write Battlestar Galactica. And, and he said, but you had a meeting with Ron D. Moore. <laughs> and I said, yes, but that's about another matter. <laughs> and it is. It's not about Battlestar. But it's like, how do you know? <laughs> how do you find these things out? There were very few people who knew I was at Universal meeting with Ron D. Moore. Amazing. Yeah. Probably the secretary's being bribed. I don't know. There are millions are everywhere. Yes. It's pretty scary. Um, well, what do we, uh, yeah. what do, we do now? <laughs> Well, there was also a question, please. Yeah, I was actually thinking about when you were talking about uh, Paramount license, so it's free download. I was thinking, how did you guys manage to convince Paramount to let you do it in the first place? Well, this is a, yeah. Well, the fascinating thing is that uh, the Paramount legal actually came after um, uh, New, New Voyages to shut them down, and then they watched the episodes and liked them, and they said basically, you can keep making these as long as you don't uh, make money off it. Well, one of the lawyers. One of the lawyers was a Trekkie. And, so, and, and also what we're finding, because I'm, in, I'm actually uh, directing the, the George Takei episode in the next few weeks. In fact, I'll, I'll pass out these flyers, because there are still things we're looking for. So uh, if you want to pass this out, it's got a great illustration of George in his uh, barbarian costume. Because, by the way, this, see, one thing that fascinated me about New Voyages was that half of the people working on New Voyages are fans, they're, which is great, and they're guys who work at the post office and so forth, and come out of love of it. But the other half are pros who love Star, Star Trek, grew up watching Star Trek, and they're, but they're working on Battlestar Galactica, they're working on you know, all these major shows. And so my costume designer is Ian McKay, who uh, designed Darth Maul and Queen Amidala. Ronald B. Moore, who has won five Emmy, Emmys on Trek, is, is advising and working on some of the effects. Um, you know, I'm working with more Emmy and Oscar winners on this production than any show I ever worked on. So it's just phenomenal. And as you said, Dorothy, the, the, the sets are just amazing. I went up to Tecon Robot to see them, and they're just, they're, they're spot on. They're terrific. Yeah, the, the really wonderful part about it, I think, is, you know, as, as I said before, I you know, always wanted to write for the original series, and uh, I got a chance to write Next Generation later, but it wasn't the same thing. Um, the great thing about it is being able to do that. Uh, it's not quite like what happened with Dorothy since she was able to, able to go back there, but I was able to go there for the first time. And after working in TV for as long as we have, you can't help but get a little jaded sometimes. But these guys' enthusiasm and they're just their, their excitement of the whole thing, it's so great. It's so much fun. It's like, it's like television should have been. <laughs> so it's just, it's, yes, it really is. Yes. Yeah, and also, obviously, if you have questions, please feel free to ask them, and we'll endeavor to answer them. Um, but also, as Michael was saying, the fun part is there's no studio, there's no network. And so, we wrote the script, they like the script, we're shooting the script, uh, we're casting the people we want to cast. There's no, um, there's no... 
There's, there's no nonsense. I mean, we just, you know, and that's, that's great fun and very freeing. And, uh, for instance, yesterday I was with, uh, with George Decay at his place, and we had the costume uh, designer, the costume builders there, and we had the stunt people there, and the stunt guy. Is, uh, well, our stunt, our stunt coordinator comes off Deep, Deep Space Nine, and, and the stunt man who was working out this, the, the sword stuff and the knife stuff with George is coming off. He, he just finished Pirates of the Caribbean 2. He's about to do some stuff on Pirates of the Caribbean 3. You know, it's just phenomenal. I mean, basically, pretty much everyone I've asked to work on this thing has said yes. Uh, Optic Nerve is doing the makeup work. Uh, they, did, they did Buffy and Babylon 5 and, 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 and um, uh, X Files. Yeah. Um sort of a related question. I mean, this is a, a fascinating transition point in, in media history. My own background is I used to work with News Corporation and, and uh, Time Warner. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we were actually talking a little bit about this before you came in. You know, the question in my mind is, for writers such as yourselves, uh, you know, your motivation you know, clearly you know, comes out of passion. Mm -hmm. Other, uh, at what point, since no one can profit from this, obviously, so you know, let's say yeah. you're not getting paid for this, yeah. George isn't getting paid for this, at what point, does this become a, a higher credential than perhaps saying, well, you know, I worked on a show, you know, that is paying on a network as long as the networks last, or on cable mm -hmm. or on satellite. When does the quality of this as a free fan production equal or eclipse in your mind, or have you already reached that point? Um, you know, credibility in something that would be a SAG or after a type of uh, mm -hmm. uh, engagement. Yeah, for those who didn't hear the question is, when does this become as, as legitimate as something that we would be doing for a network or for, or, or for a studio? Does that mean that it you're sure, paraphrasing a bit? Yeah. Well, it, it was very freeing. Uh, I could write a 60-minute show. I, I, I did do a teaser in 4X, which was our old structure, which is what they wanted. But, oh my God, do you know what television is now? Come on, I've been, I've, I'm going to be teaching a class at the American Film Institute on television dramatic writing this fall. So I've been looking at a lot of shows, and just out of curiosity, I started logging the time of actual story. Do you know what it is? This is prime time network stuff. 40 to 45 minutes of story. Now, when I was writing the original track, it was 56 minutes of story. Look how much you've lost. Yeah. Nice. As I, I said the other day, we used to be able to do an A line, a B line, a C line. Now, you get an A and a B. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. How much fits onto, a, onto a, 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 a CD? Yeah. It used to be only three episodes with Star Trek Classic. Now it's four episodes for uh, yeah. just local. Right. Well, to answer your question, well, I think it already. I think there's some legitimacy already there. Um, this particular production, I mean, this, the Star Trek New Voyages, it's sort of like become more than a fan production. Maybe it's not quite a professional production yet, but it certainly has a lot of professionals working on it. One of the added benefits that we've had of writing the script, which is totally unexpected to us, is that it has become a great sample script for our work. You know, because people read, everybody knows what we've got Kirk or Smock. So that, that, that was pure serendipity then. And, and, and just one more thing, which has already been said, but I'll say it again. There's no network, no studio, nobody to answer to. The scripts are our own. The only person I talked to about the script was Walter because I wanted to get his take on that character at that moment in his life. Yes, but well, also in this regard, what Michael was talking about. Uh, I mean, the reason I mean, for, for those of us in, the, in this game, in this, in this career, we're writing because we have something we want to communicate, something we want to say, something we want to create, something truthful that lasts. And certainly, what Dorothy wrote for Star Trek is certainly. Uh, done that in, in, to a huge degree, uh, but that's really why we're writing, and it's very nice to earn money, it's very nice to earn a living, uh, but that's not the main priority. The main priority is to work with people we love to work with and create quality work. Um, in terms of, for myself, um, when I was 22 I sat down and I made a list of what I wanted to do as a, uh, as a, a creative person, and what I wrote down was I wanted to write half-hour comedy, hour drama, pilots, movies of the week, feature films, Nonfiction books, novels, I wanted to write for the radio, and I wanted to direct. And so I've done all of that, except I hadn't directed yet on any large scale. So when this came about, and Michael and I were writing this thing, uh, I said to James Colley, by the way, if your uh, director falls out, I'd be very interested in having a conversation about possibly directing this. And he said, well, point blank, would you like to direct this? And I said, yes. And he said, well, then you're the director. And uh, he said, one less problem for me. <laughs> and. Uh, 
And what this allows me to do is it allows me to, have, first of all, have someone else pay for the production costs involved in me directing something, and also direct something right out of the gate that has enormous visibility. I mean, these guys are getting, as Dorothy said, they've already had more than 30 million downloads, and they also last month alone had 7 million hits on their website. We've already made the front page of the New York Times and the Today Show with an episode we haven't even shot yet. So, uh, so whereas if I directed a short film, you know, well, what's that, who's that? You know, this, so this allows me to learn my craft and also to work in a universe that's great fun to work in, and also deal with fight scenes, effects, character moments, all that stuff that Star Trek did so brilliantly. So, and, and but the cool part of it is, it's also the the um, special effects bag of tricks now, yeah. because this is these are effect, the effects guys from Battlestar Galactica and so on and so forth. These are the cutting edge guys now. So it's it's really cool. So, um, other questions? Uh, is there another question anywhere? In, yeah. Yeah. Well, Chris. Okay. yeah. 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 Okay, this is for Dorothy. Um, this, this kind of energy and excitement and passion around the new voyages, would you compare it to what was happening in the mid-70s when there were just a few of us who thought we had a great secret called the Star Trek, this old TV show? Is it, is it kind of the new version of the, that same kind of passion that, that brought the franchise back in those days, or is it something else? No, I think it is that passion that, that carries forward. I mean, we, we've said time and again at this convention, because it's the 40th anniversary of Star Trek, that, you know, it was the fans that made it the 40th anniversary of Star Trek. It could have been just a three-season show that went away and, you know, it was fond memory for somebody, but uh, it was the passion of the fans that kept it on for three seasons. It was the passion of the fans that renewed its life in syndication. I mean, Paramount has probably made a bajillion dollars just running the original series in, in syndication, let alone all the others. And of course it generated the other, uh, you know, the movies, the other series, etc. But that original passion, I think, still exists. And it exists in these fans who are doing this project today. So do you think it's going to impact them at all in, in now reinventing the yes. franchise? Which obviously yeah, is. I'm sure it will impact them again. It already yeah. has. Yeah. Um, but what I suggested to Jim Coley was, you know, you really ought to go to Paramount. And since we do write a teaser in 4X, and they do fade out at the end and fade into the next, um, what they want to do is tell Paramount, hey, you know, um, you guys could advertise your series, your new TV series, and your movies on our site in those commercial breaks. And uh, <clears throat> maybe you'd pay us a little for doing that. <laughs> In time, if not money. Yeah. Although money would be nice. And money would be good. Um, yeah, the, the amazing thing also is that a lot of people who are working on this production with such passion and excitement weren't even born when they were very young when the show was done for the first time. Um, it's, I don't, I can't think of any other television series, I may be wrong, but I really can't think of any one other one that is where the catchphrases and the terminology and everything have become so firmly imprinted in popular culture, in the um, people's psyche. You know, you can say, beam me up, Scotty, which is never said on the show. You know, to anybody, they know what you're talking about, unless they've been living in a cave in Iran for, you know, 40 years. Um, it's just remarkable. Yeah. But also, the, the question of whether this is influencing um, the, uh, the networks and the studios and the, star, the, and the official Star Trek franchise, uh, it already has in a very specific way. Uh, for instance, when, earlier when you were asking about uh, legitimate so-called uh, entertainment, um, the show, I, I, I met the showrunner on 24 last week, uh, Howard Gordon, and he already, he, he's reading this script, he wanted to die and see this episode. Uh, the guys who are running most of the, the network shows, certainly all of the science fiction ones, including the shows like CSI, these guys all are just, they're huge Trekkies, they love this stuff. And they're, and they're eager to see these things, because the one thing that the, Trek, the original Trek didn't do is they didn't, they didn't do the great Chekhov episode. They didn't do the great Sulu episode. Because, those, because unlike Next Gen, which, which rotated the cast so that each one of them had their moment in the sun on the, on the show, the original Star Trek was Kirk, Spock, McCoy, and you have, and you have made a little bit of business they give to Sulu, a little bit of business they give to Chekhov. In these scripts, what Dorothy and Michael and I are doing is we're allowing those characters that we've loved for 40 years to finally have a spotlight on them for an entire episode, you say, wow, now they get to talk about their life as men and what this whole journey has been about, and that's really great. Uh, I've noticed that, um, that within the original series, um, two characters that seem to have a big impact on the show 
but lastly, new wood or um, or nurse chapel and um, and, um, and the yeoman. Um, yes, yeoman band. Band, yeah. yes, that's the name. Um, yeah. Are they getting any attention in the service? Well, Grace, Grace Lee Whitney is going to be in the episode that we're that we're shooting, and uh, so we're we're actually going to have her aboard. And uh, and in terms of of nurse chapel, um, I don't I don't think Major Barrett's going to be. Uh, in, in New Voyages, but a character I would love to bring back, because it was always a fascinating character they never, they never explored, was the character of number one in the first pilot. And uh, there's a friend of ours, is Julie Caitlin Brown, who, uh, who's who been in Babylon 5 and so forth. She's tall and has raven black hair, and I think she'd be great in that. Well, we've actually talked about that to her, she, and uh, she's very excited about that. But just, just to finish one point, um, uh, in terms of the, the impact of New Voyages within the television, the television community, there was a point on during the final season of Enterprise where Manny Cotto was trying to convince uh, um, Rick Berman to let him bring back some of the tropes and some of the characters and, uh, and, and species from the original show. And Berman said, well, um, I mean, how many original Star Trek fans are there left? One or two? And, 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 at which point Manny Cotto said, no, there's something called Star Trek New Voyages, and the single night, night they beat us by two million viewers. And that convinced Rick Berman to let Manny Cotto start bringing back those characters and those those creatures, and so that so already New Voyages changed that final season of Enterprise significantly, and uh, a lot yeah yeah they, a prop actually they actually the got the Sulu scope the yeah they got the Sulu scope from uh, from New Voyages because they, they didn't have the time to build one for one of their episodes <laughs> yeah um, yeah question back there is Manny Cotto going to be involved in the New Voyages he's reading the one I'm about to shoot that's as far as we know I mean I just talked to him a few days ago he's 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 changed Enterprise. Enterprise. yeah he's he's a wonderful writer he but he's on he's on staff as an executive producer on 25 right now and so I don't think he'll be doing New Voyages but I'm sure he'll be doing other things he's doing he's doing other things right now but 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 he's doing other things right now
out of that. And, I, and we're hopeful we'll you know, come back and ask us in a few weeks and we'll know what happened. But uh, yeah. A follow-up a different and, and specifically uh, sort of Dorothy. Um, when you were developing you know, the shooting script, or going from the story to the teleplay, um, did you, particularly with your experience in the original series, find that because there was such attention to detail in maintaining the visual language and the canon of the old series, that you started bumping up against familiar barriers and limitations? Um, you know, because the old series was, among other things, to sell color television sets or had uh, relatively inexpensive sets and had to be lit, you know, with the same amount of lighting, uh, just configured different ways on a moment's notice. So did you find that your visual storytelling uh, had to somehow be constrained at all uh, for this uh, to serve all my days? Or did you find yourself very, uh, you know, it was it very different from, or, or not different at all from when you wrote for the old series? It wasn't different at all. Uh, I could write any story I wanted. I wrote the story I liked. I was crying at the end of it. I hope there will not be a dry eye in the house when the episode concludes. Um, and, uh, you know, I just had a great time writing it. I had no restrictions whatsoever. I didn't have any pause. I just sat down and started writing, and it almost wrote itself because it was just going back to those characters in that world that I love so much. Yeah, well, all, but, and also in that regard, uh, Michael and I, I, I never thought I'd be writing a script, you know, Kirk, Spock, McCoy, it was great fun. And Michael and I both watched the entire first season of, of, of the original Trek, we watched all the features over again, we got those characters really solidly in our heads. And um, and the other thing was, in terms of the visual, we want, with the episode we're about to shoot, we want it very much to be Star Trek and have the Star Trek look, but I've also brought aboard my DP, I, my wife and I uh, wrote and executive produced a pilot uh, project with Tom Fontana, who created and ran Oz, and, he was running, yeah, no, really, yeah, exactly. People ask that all the time, and so he, but he created and ran Oz, and he uh, was running Homicide at the time. So the DP we had on that project, we brought aboard New Voyages. So he'll be going out to Ticonderoga with us. We're shooting all the scenes in Ticonderoga, except we're rebuilding the Excelsior Bridge here. We'll shoot shoot those scenes here. So yeah, and other questions? Yeah. I'd like to congratulate you on watching the old Star Trek before you do it. Yeah. Marina Sirtis was a yesterday uh -huh. and told how the last director of the last movie mm -hmm. said he hadn't watched any of the Star Trek at all yeah. and he was doing his own version of Star Trek the yeah. next generation for the movie and he was being paid for this. Yeah, well, you, I mean, any time that someone approaches Trek with either um, contempt or a desire to remake it and throw out what's come before, they're making a huge mistake. I had lunch uh, a few weeks ago with J.J. Abrams, who's going to be producing and possibly directing the new Star Trek feature. And he has a great deal of respect for the franchise, and, and the writers he's brought aboard from Mission Impossible 3 are, are huge fans of Trek. So hopefully it will be like what happened with Nicholas Meyer on, on Wrath of Khan, where it's a new interpretation, but a wonderful one. So we can hope. Yeah. Um, you just mentioned the new feature film. What, if anything, can you tell us about that? Um, I, I, I don't know more than you do because we didn't. I, I didn't want to say to him, "Well, tell me what you're doing." Because I know he, they're at the very early stages. They're just starting starting to work on it. Um, you know, I mean, the, you know, we all know the same rumors. My guess would be that they're going to do Kirk Spock McCoy younger, but who knows? We'll see. Anything else? Yeah. 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 Yeah.